Priced at $2,500 for the pair, Triangle Audio is offering a beautiful looking speaker that may appeal to some audiophiles for its exciting and dynamic sound, while others might find it aggressive and forward. And I'd imagine now is a time that you are asking yourself, how the heck could I possibly know this? And with a warm welcome back to New Record Day, that's exactly what we're going to find out. All right, folks, do yourself a favor and grab a pair of headphones. We got some work to do. In this review, it is my goal to walk you through what you can expect if you decide to buy the 40th anniversary Comets from Triangle Audio. And I believe using a combination of sound clips, my listening impressions, and objective data from measurements, this might be the only review that you really need to know what the heck is going on with these speakers. So without wasting another second, let's chat about what the Comets are and then we will dive into the meat and taters of how these things actually sound. The 40th Anniversary Comet is a two-way ported bass reflex bookshelf speaker that features a new rose gold anodized magnesium dome tweeter and a new mid-range bass driver in natural cellulose paper. The tweeter is horn loaded and based on the design principles. This speaker falls more into the camp of narrow dispersion or controlled directivity on the top end. Now, one bias that I have, and I will mention it now, I tend to prefer wider dispersion loudspeakers and with a room that is perfectly symmetrical and treated, I don't care as much about controlled directivity and I prefer having the sound of things scattering all over the place in the room. So please consider that bias as we progress with listening impressions. As for the woofer, Triangle has always impressed me with the continued use of paper derivatives, and most of you fine folks know this about me. For me, paper cone drivers almost always sound more realistic and natural. And the good news is that with the Comet, this was my experience with the overall tone heard from the speaker's woofer. That is to say, Lower frequencies, mainly male vocals and mid bass, do offer a quick and natural timbre. And while I still have some gripes about the frequency voicing, I have no issues with the texture and tone of these speakers when it comes to the woofers. The Comet comes in three finishes, and the one that I have is the Golden Oak. The speaker is drop dead gorgeous for those who dig a glossy glass-like finish. The speaker comes with spikes, one being metal or rubber for placing the speaker on a shelf of some type. Otherwise, and I would imagine the more popular method for listening, Triangle does offer matching 40th anniversary stands with these speakers as well. The speaker's rated response shows plus or minus 3 dB from 47 hertz to 22 kilohertz. And based on what I have seen in room, this all sounds very reasonable and very believable. I should also note that taking these numbers into account, you will absolutely need a subwoofer for deep bass with the Comets. Rounding out the specs, the Comet is rated at 8 ohms and 90 decibel sensitivity, and in my testing was an easy to drive speaker that works well with a number of amplifiers in house. First, everything that I heard from bass up to lower mid range sounds a little bit on the lean side. While the tone is quite natural sounding and quick to respond, or even punchy and even dynamic, I was surprised just how much bolder two other competitive speakers sounded compared to the Comets, both being similar size stand mounts and both being cheaper as well. As I've already mentioned, most folks will definitely need to pair these up with a subwoofer to make up the difference, but it's also important to note, I'm not talking about really deep bass here, I'm talking about like 50 hertz and even higher. Think of kick drums, tom toms, and lower percussion. While I appreciated the fact that the Triangle used a paper cone derivative for these speakers, I just felt like mid bass sounded a little bit shy for my liking and the overall bass response seemed to be missing a little bit of weight and density in the mid bass. With that being said, I am happy to report that I didn't catch any cabinet resonance with this speaker, but at the same time, I could clearly hear some lower parts of the human voice from the front ports and this was a distraction on lower baritones and bass vocals. I think it would have been wise had Triangle either placed these ports on the back of the speaker or offered port plugs. 
The reason that I mention this is I did have some foam laying around and sure enough, stuffing the front ports did help eliminate the noise that was distracting me while getting to know this speaker. I had high hopes that plugging the ports would show some worthwhile differences in the frequency response or spectral decay, but unfortunately, since I am doing a gated response, this isn't gonna show up in any of my objective data in this particular review. Now where things change a bit in terms of voicing was when listening to either higher pitched male vocals or female vocals. I definitely noticed a bloom right away opening up just above the fundamentals of the human voice, which made me think there had to be some kind of a deviation from a straight line in the speaker's frequency response. Later down the road, when we take a look at the measurements, this was confirmed to be absolutely true. I also noticed that above the fundamentals, way out there where we are typically hearing harmonics, these again sounded elevated or enhanced when conveying top end information. Similar as to what I have heard with some V-shaped speakers, think some Klipsch, uh, B&W, and even Focal, the top end of the triangle definitely imparts more top end emphasis to the music, which for me, to be honest with you, was a bit distracting over long listening sessions. As I continue listening to the comments, I found that the top end, especially the crack of cymbals or splashes, to sound quite sibilant, even to the point where some tracks nearly sound crunchy or even distorted. Keeping in mind, I'm not listening anywhere, anywhere near above 90 decibel peaks these days. There is no way that I should be driving these speakers to a breaking point, so, I just had to accept the fact that this top end that I'm hearing was in fact the bullseye that Triangle was aiming for. Alrighty, sound clips. First, no, this won't tell you everything about how a speaker sounds, and yes, if you play this back on your phone, then this will all sound like your phone does. So, I strongly suggest grabbing a pair of headphones if you haven't already, and please understand, the sound clips are here to complement my listening impressions and measurements. Now, as we get started, I want you to consider two questions as we dive into the sound clips. Question number one, when a reference recording is played back, do we want or do you want or desire a speaker or even hi-fi system that gets close to matching the reference recording? So. As we make our way through the clips, this is the first thing that I want you to think about as the tracks play. First, I'll play the reference track, then I'll play the same clip recorded on the comments. As you listen to both, I would encourage you to ask yourself, if these two clips don't sound alike, where do you hear the differences? And with that, let's have a listen. Hey, you couldn't see it coming. You might have thought it, but you couldn't change it. Hey, you couldn't see it coming. You might have thought it, but you couldn't change it. So I don't know about you, but when I play these tracks back, and the same thing applies to listening in the room, I am immediately drawn to the top end of her voice. Yes, this lends itself to a perception of more detail in some cases, but to my ears, it comes at the cost of less body in her voice. Also, anytime I hear an S syllable, it sounds spitty and sibilant. I also notice when the bass hits around eight seconds into the clip, it misses some of the deeper impact heard in the reference clip. Now, let's play that exact same clip, but this time we will use the Kef R3's really popular speaker as an example. Here we go. Hey, you couldn't see it coming. You might have thought it, but you couldn't change it. Hey, you couldn't see it coming. Okay, so with the R3s, the one thing that caught my attention within a second of the first phrase is that her voice sounds 
closer to the reference recording. Sure, it's still not as close as I would call perfect, but with less top-end information leading the charge, it just seems to me that her voice sounds more relaxed and at ease. I also notice that when the bass comes in, it sounds more weighty and offers more density than the triangle does. Now, let's try this same exercise with my reference stand mount, the XLS Encores. Hey, you couldn't see it coming. You might have thought it, but you couldn't change it. Hey, you couldn't see coming you might have thought it but you couldn't change it all right so call me a fanboy or whatever you like but i won't deny what i am not only hearing in the clips but also in the room the encores to me at least sound the closest to the reference recording her voice sounds more at ease and all the body of her voice sounds intact it's as if all of the puzzle pieces of the performance are in place and we get the full picture. When the bass hits, it offers a similar impact of the kef, but also sounds a little more natural to me, which will become more apparent with some of the other clips that we're going to be listening to. All right, in this next track, let's try some male vocals and see if we notice anything worthwhile. Again, just like before, we will start with the reference recording and then, of course, the triangles. Staying at home, turn off the phone, I will listen to you. Staying at home, turn off the phone, I will listen to you. All right, so with this track, I hear more emphasis on the top end of the recording, but for me, what really catches my attention is the lack of body in the lower mid range or mid bass. It's almost as if there is information missing, and when I play this track back, especially in the room, it's one of these tracks that it just feels a little bit thinner than I would like. Let's try the Kef R3s and see how it sounds. Staying at home, turn off the phone, I will listen to you. Staying at home, turn off the phone, I will listen. Okay, so we got some of the body back, and while I do think there is still a little bit more emphasis on the top part of his voice, I think this sounds a lot closer to the recording than the comments. Last, let's try the same track and hear how the encores handle the recording. Staying at home, turn off the phone, I will listen to you. Staying at home, turn off the phone, I will listen. All right, so on this track, the kefs and encore sound a lot more alike than different in this particular recording, and it seems to me that the bass sounds a little bit more dense and deeper with the encores, but besides that, both sound closer to the reference recording as far as I'm concerned. Okay, back to female vocals, but this time we will add some dynamics in the mix and try something a little bit busier. Here are the triangles. Leave no part of me on skate when you rip me all right what i noticed with the comments is really a lack of body and again an emphasis on the top end being specific if you listen to the acoustic guitar which is panned a little bit to the left you will notice more body in the reference recording I also notice anytime there is an S syllable, it again seems a little hot or sibilant sounding. The kick just doesn't have the same weight or impact as the reference recording as well. While I can hear the sound of the beater being smacked, I'm missing a little more depth from the kick drum in this track. I also feel like it's harder to keep up with the bass guitar lines in this track compared to the reference recording. Moving on, let's try this exact same comparison, but this time with the Kef R3s and see what we get. Leave no part of me on skate when you rip me. Go smoke into every little cell. Smoke into every little cell. 
So for me, the acoustic sounds less plinky and sounds more natural, which for me is a good thing. Her voice also has a little bit more weight, but most of all, that percussion section, including the bass guitar, just got jacked. In both cases, it just lays down a better foundation and it makes the track sound more meaty and dynamic to my ears. And now, let's take these encores for a spin and see what these guys sound like. Leave no part of me unscathed when you rip me No smoke into every little cell With the encores, this recording is almost a perfect match minus the room loss that we get in the recording itself. Since I know what that sounds like, it's probably easier for me to filter that out, but to me, this speaker offers the same level of body, depth, and weight that makes the song sound as big as it does in the reference recording. Her voice sounds balanced and non-sibilant. The guitar sounds neutral, and it's pretty easy to hear the body and resonances that follows with the sound of the strings. All right, let's finish the clips with one more track that really pushes the envelope. This is a massive sounding metal track with some strings playing along with it. Clearly, there is bigger and deeper bass than any of these speakers can really reach, but it also helps us figure out top to bottom resolution and dynamics in a quick hurry. I think you guys are gonna dig this one, so with the triangle on deck, here we go. So in my listening impressions, I mentioned a crunchy and sometimes distorted sounding top end. This track perfectly expresses what I am hearing, and once you hear it, you can't unhear it. For the record, listen to me carefully, I don't think that the comments are actually distorting, and my gut tells me it's a part of the recording. However, when a speaker is tipsy or has a rise in the response, these small little details might pop out, and in this case, not in a good way. Also, the bass hits and all percussion sounds thin in the recording and not even close to the same level of depth and punch that the reference is actually trying to convey. All right, let's fire up these R3s from Kef and see if we get any closer to how this track is supposed to sound. So in those first quick hits, that top end and decay does still sound a little bit distorted, but to me, it sounds more intentional, as if it's pulled back enough that you can hear it for what it's supposed to be or what it was meant to be in the recording process. I also think that more meat on the bones is helping by evening out the overall balance in the track, which makes the entire segment sound larger, bigger, and more cinematic. While we still aren't hitting all of the lowest of the bass hits, I'd say that this is getting much closer to the reference, which I think is certainly a good thing. And last folks, let's go ahead and go back to the encores and see how they handle this massive metal track. Alright, so for me, the encores tie with the kefs, but sound a little bit darker than I would have called perfect. Some of this loss in resolution is a loss in the recording process, but I did like how vibrant the kefs sounded up top compared to the encores. 
However, and this was a surprise, I feel like the encores nailed the tone, speed, and natural sound of the drum hits. Sure, they can't quite reach all the lower harmonics and neither could the other two speakers, but to my ears, what they did hit sounded spot on. So, now that we have some evidence to help us answer the first question, you now get to decide which of these speakers sounds the most like the reference recording. That's up to you to decide. For me, keeping this review on track, I'd say, without a doubt, it was the triangle that sounded the least like the reference recording in all of the tracks. And this leads to the second question that I want you to ponder. If in fact, a speaker doesn't sound like the reference track, what does this mean? And how should that impact your buying decisions? You know, after helping folks out for over a decade on what speakers to buy, what gear they should consider, and so much more, my thoughts would go something like this. When you intentionally buy a speaker that has a voice of its own, or a voice that deviates from the reference recording that is played back, you are taking on the responsibility to cater to that particular voicing regardless of your gear decisions and the room you are listening in. That is to say, in this example, if you decide to buy a speaker that is voiced like the Triangle Comet, I'd imagine that having specific gear that's warmer or more relaxed would be other important factors that you must also consider. So that's a conundrum, right? I mean, do you have that gear right now? And if so, how do you know that it's warm in all the right places to complement the Comet's voicing? In other words, how do you know it's going to complement the specific rises in the response of this speaker? <sighs> the truth is, it's hard to know the truth without taking a chance, and that's my point here. Speakers that do not offer a linear or balanced response are almost always a double-edged sword in this regard, and I would strongly recommend you think this carefully through. Also, and this is way more important than any piece of gear, the room. That's right. And you knew this was coming. My room, which has been carefully treated, offers reverb times less than 300 milliseconds through most of the bandwidth and is within five decibels from 40 hertz all the way up to 20K. Now in my room, speakers like this can be tolerated and I'd imagine some audiophiles might enjoy this speaker in my room. But that's my point here. That's my room with very intentional acoustic treatment and designed from the ground up for listening to music. Asking me how the speaker is gonna sound in your room, it's nearly impossible because of its deviations and being able to predict how it will behave is something that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing. As for the kefs and the encores, it's much easier as I am certain both of these speakers will be more adaptable to different listening environments. The last thing that I want to discuss is measurements, which will help us solidify that what we have both heard in the sound clips and what I have heard throughout the review process is real. I'm not making any of this stuff up and I can back it up with these measurements. First, here is a frequency response of the comments. As we can see, there is indeed a rise in the response from 500 to 1500 Hertz, which is definitely audible. This three to four decibel peak smack dab right above the heart of mid band absolutely points to the bloom that I heard in my listening impressions. While this aspect of the speaker didn't show up as much in the recordings, what did stand out is the other rise in the response starting from 5K and lasting through the rest of the speaker's top end extension. Now, I'll say this, I expected this rise to be lower and I'd imagine that one reason why it's standing out as much as it is could be the material of the tweeter combined with the rise in the response, which to me 
sounds a little bit metallic or a little bit artificial sounding. It sounds like an aluminum dome tweeter to me. Next, the Spectral Decay looks fair, but not great. There are some traces of stored energy, but nothing crazy or offensive here. As for the horizontal response, it looks pretty good, showing a decent grouping and natural fall away from 10 degrees to 40 degrees. The vertical response looks fine up until we hit 12 and 16 inches above the speaker, where we can see a decent hole in the response right at 2500 hertz. While this isn't the end of the world, I do want to remind us that we are indeed looking at a $2,500 pair of speakers, and I would have liked to have seen tighter tolerances in the vertical performance. The last and final response tying this all together is I want to start again by showing the frequency response of the Comets in red. And now I'll introduce the frequency response of the Kef R3s in orange. As we can see, just as we heard, the Kefs sound a little bit closer to the reference recordings and would you know it is more linear in response. And last, we can bring in the Humble Encore, which is in yellow and clearly shows the most linear response of all three speakers and to my ears sounded that way in the sound clips. Priced at $2,500, the Triangle Comet has a lot of competition and with a voicing that certainly deviates from a linear response, it's hard to predict who wants a speaker to sound exactly like the Comets. The speaker looks incredible, and there are some parts of the speaker's tone that I appreciated. However, when piecing this puzzle together, I find myself walking away with more questions and answers after my time with the comments. Perhaps there are folks out there who want exactly what the speaker has to offer, and that's fine. While I am more interested in a straight line or the truth tellers when it comes to hi-fi gear, I guess there are others who are searching for something like these triangle speakers and what they have to offer. So yeah, that's the question that I'll ask you. Are you after a speaker that deviates from the sound of the reference recording? And if so, do you think that the comet is a dragon that you are chasing? And with that, I'll see you triangle loving audiophiles in the next video.